All right, welcome to Imperial Advisor, episode three. Uh, we've got uh, our usual suspects. We've got uh, Baz, Owen, Justin, and Andy. Thankfully, has joined us from the beach, where he's uh, on location. But he's made the time for us to uh, to because it's that important to him to be be part of the show. <laughs> And take on feedback. I know we do listen and read the comments. So someone who is very upset by Andy, Andy's sort of bare minimalist room. So we've uh, remedied that as well. Um, so the plan for today's show, we're going to talk obviously about the Crane Clan, since uh, that's kind of been the big uh, news of the last couple of weeks. All the reveals, I think we've got a pretty complete idea of uh, what, what the Crane are going to look like. I think it's probably a couple of cards we suspect that, that are not quite there, but we've got a pretty complete view of that. Then uh, also on the agenda, a few little bits and pieces from the Facebook live stream. I think a few sort of rules, uh, nuances and details were clarified. We'll get to kind of the issue of Gen Con tickets. And I know uh, a few people have strong opinions on how that was handled and, and how that sort of worked out. Uh, and... I think the other thing we're going to cover this week is uh, we've obviously been very positive over the last few weeks because we're, we're really excited about the game, but I think there's a few sort of lingering concerns at the back of our minds that uh, we'll, we'll sort of have a discussion about and see, you know, uh, how we think that might be handled, what, what potential solutions that are, and, and uh, see where that takes us. So that's kind of the plan for the show today. And I guess the best place to start is with the crane. So uh, two weeks ago, or a little, little under two weeks ago, we had the first piece of fiction and uh, Her Father's Daughter by DG Ladderoot, who, if people haven't checked out the interview we did with him, uh, it was really interesting. He's um, got a lot to say and had a lot of kind of insights about the process of writing. And, and he's obviously come from a background of working with AEG and you know how that worked uh, writing and working with the FFG uh, fiction team and the process of creating that story and then kind of a little bit of the the insight into the characters involved their motivations and uh, just a little bit of a deeper understanding and obviously the insight into Yoritomo and more importantly Fumio the cat and you know what they're going to bring to the story in the future um but i guess Aside from that, maybe let's start with the, the the cards that we've seen. So, I know, Baz, you sort of spent a bit of time, you did an article uh, looking at sort of the Crane Clan cards as a whole. Yep. Where do you feel they are? Do, do, I mean, it's obviously hard to say that having a, a similar view of another clan, but do you feel like they're in a good place? Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, obviously, it's it's hard enough to, to get an idea but and I'll, we'll, we'll get to see a little bit more of that once the, the line cards come out. But, I mean, they've got a clear focus. The, the cards work well together. Um, you kind of have an idea what they're looking to do. It does look like they can certainly try for honor, but what I found interesting when I was going through it all was there isn't a requirement for them to do so. Uh, they can still draw a bunch of cards, honor a bunch of personalities, and head over there and crush provinces via politics just as much as the line can from what we can see so far and um, so that was that was kind of interesting and there seems to be a lot of nice intricacies on the cards that you know i didn't necessarily understand first time around um at least on on the first read stuff like uh the asahina artisan and um, being really good for holding on to the imperial favor because as a zero zero who bows to give plus three political you're probably not going to assign them so uh, mm. On, on your first political attack, she's not going to sign. If you need her, you can bow her. And similar with the political defense. So there's a good chance that you're never going to need to bow her, especially with the kind of political dominance that the crane has. Um, and she's got two glory. Um, like if you compare her to Dorji Whisperer, who's a 0-3, who was only one, that to me indicates that they were aware that the, the artisan would be typically unbowed at the end of the turn. Um, and yeah, just lots of little things like that that looked intentional and seem to indicate that they have a good idea of what they're doing when they're designing these cards. So yeah, Crane looks very exciting. Um, 
I really like the dueling elements that they have because uh, duels tend to be fun. But one of the yeah, one of the things I did also notice was that you've got if you count up all the characters we've seen so far and just taught up all the military and taught up all the political, they're looking at thirty political across all the characters and still twenty military. Um, so I mean, considerable. Yeah, I mean it's 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 definitely different to what we were used to. This whole sit back and just you know defend with weenies uh, to do what we must and the occasional duel and basically just hamper attacks. No, no, this this looks like a really really offensive and aggressive crane, which um, looks very exciting actually. Um, and Justin, we 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 played a game um, on Tabletop Simulator on Wednesday when we sort of got got all the cards. That also on our YouTube, if people want to check that out. Um, you you played the Crane Clan. How did it feel playing them? Did 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 you feel you got a good handle on on, on one playthrough? Did you feel you need to spend a lot more time? Uh, with well, I mean. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you need to spend more time with it. And with seeing more cards, then strategies are going to change and evolve. Um, yeah, I, I'd echo what uh, what Baz was saying to a certain degree. I felt they were much better set up to be an aggressive, honorable military clan than they necessarily were for honor running. Although that said, you know, we the, the I did try to honor run in the game just to see if it was if it was viable, um, and it was extraordinarily tense. It's Actually, in stark contrast to honor running in, <clears throat> excuse me, the previous version of L5R, which was without a doubt the most passive and least interesting, probably way to pursue victory. Uh, in this case, there were an awful lot of really hard decisions that had to be made, particularly pertaining to card draw and bidding on cards, um, that could easily have turned the game one way or the other. Um, so, so honor running is now a really, it's very much a, a, a tactical decision. I think you can probably set your deck up to pursue honor as a primary victory condition. Uh, but that said, there are still so many decisions to be made each and every turn as to how you're going to do what you're prepared to sacrifice um, in order to, you know, not lose a province or hope you don't lose a province that turn. Um, uh, so, but definitely the honoring mechanic, I, f I thought would be a very, very effective way to, you know, effectively superpower your, um, your characters and send them across. And I mean, obviously you can create then a, a much more aggressive deck from that. So yeah. and actually, yeah. And with the negation abilities as well, uh, they have a surprising amount of resilience in battles i think you know that they, they if the the they have the the, the basically the, the counter spell the, the game's counter spell mm. um which can give you you know wins in decisive conflicts um and although that said <clears throat> on the flip side one of the very interesting things i found about honor running uh, which is obvious of course yeah what's <laughs> obvious now wasn't it wasn't immediately obvious before was that you can es essentially ignore your opponent's regions um as a military like if you're aiming to go over and break provinces you can't you you have to encounter them and you have to overcome them if your aim is to honor run then what you can do is just find one mostly harmless province that's not going to do a lot to you and just bounce off it and when your mm -hmm. conflicts there um you know mounting up your 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 ring effects uh, and advancing yourself toward victory because i mean in the games that we've played so far because we have so few regions the the phoenix region the one that changes the 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 conflict type has been overwhelmingly you know has been, has been yeah. completely game exciting in in a couple of instances if you're if you're on a running yeah you just don't care it's, just, it's yeah. never going to come into the game so and I think so that's yeah one one of the issues with that phoenix uh, mushy something is Could when I we've worry? been putting when we've been putting together the multi clan deck, we or I've typically been focusing on the most efficient military characters just because I thought, well, I'm building a military deck, I'm attacking, I'll go for that. Does not seem to be the right way to do things. There needs to be at least some sort of balance. Um, which, when they were doing the, the live stream, one of the questions that they got is, what do you put into your crane decks? And the answer from that side was, I think, lion and unicorn, because they wanted a little bit more uh, military focus to kind of balance things out. So it, it might be because the decks that we've been putting together for to, to actually attack and aggressively attack are overly, overly 
um, specialized into military, mm. which may be, may be a mistake. Which is quite interesting because, I mean, typically when you're deck building, you, you aim to sort of just be really, really good at one thing yeah. in, in most games. Like you have a, a focus, whether that's blitzing and attacking really quickly, whether it's, you know, holding off and playing control, whether it's, you know, honor running and just defending behind that. So this sort of, this style of game where you you actually aim for a sort of balanced deck with a sort of, I mean, it, first of all, it's kind of a, a nice sort of idea of this sort of oriental and balance and, you know, um, yin and yang and five rings and that sort of uh, aspect of it. But it's also interesting from just a pure mechanics and game design point of view. Um, and uh, as as Proft briefly is, is mentioning in the chat, uh, honor running itself is limiting your opponent's card draw because after a while they just have to stop. Yeah. Uh, so even from a military perspective, it's making sense. Yeah. One of the things I found really interesting about observing the games and reflecting on them is that there is definitely a play style of Crane, which will basically look to buy two or three guys in their provinces a turn, honor them, and then get them discarded each turn and put you on a hard clock. And I think the natural counterplay to that is then looking at, okay, well, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to build up for a really big turn. I'm going to basically start my production slow. I'm going to ramp up so that when you only have your three or four guys out, I'm going to hit you with a hammer blow in turn three or four of a massive army that I've built up over time. And I'm going to play defensively up to that point. So it's an interesting inversion of the normal. It's not military going across and just trying to push honor's face in. It's going to be, well, we're going to play for different big turns and attempt to win on those big turns. And it's even interesting looking at what card draws available to honor. Because honor used to be all about, I'll draw cards, I'll throw the cards away, I'll, I'll buy myself more time. Yeah. Whereas Honor and this is going to be a lot more, actually, I'm playing for a bit more board position and I'm trying to be more, much more parsimonious with my cards because I'm not going to be able to draw them as easily. I just can't dial in draw five. But you something know? I yeah. think that's quite interesting how they've designed the crane. They've, they've given uh, them opportunities to, to have access to cards. In and uh, They talked about this in the Facebook that in a more open way so it's it's like revealing cards on your from your conflict deck and being able to play them uh like revealing and drawing so it's it gives them access to conflict cards so uh, they don't have to bid uh, as aggressively although obviously the, the bluffing aspect of that can can be interesting um and they they if they have decided they want to flip into a much more aggressive let's take provinces mode they they can they have enough honor to do that uh, if they want to sort of throw away that secondary win condition option. Um, but I quite I do like that idea of in a weird way honorable is you know you, you can access cards but you're gonna have to do it in a more transparent way. Yeah. Uh, another thing I found playing the well certainly playing the crane was the idea of an acceptable loss. Um, because again, in the old Five Rings game, there was no such thing as an acceptable loss. If you lost the battle, you pretty much lost the game. Uh, whereas in this, uh, very very frequently, you are you're not just weird. You're not weighing up what happens this turn. You're weighing up what happens you know in a turn's time or two turn time. Um, so again, so that the, the 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 tactical breadth of the game is extended compared to the the old game, which. You know, it, you you have to take a, a much more uh, holistic view of the game, uh, as opposed to simply trying to maximize your efficiency on every single turn. So, yeah, again, it's like the, the kind of the non-linearity of the game was uh, was more more apparent running this honor. Is, than, than this is been. where, sorry, Justin, this is oh, where no. I would say um, uh, Owen's comments on like the big big blow up turn is it, kind of it becomes really really interesting because I, I'm not even sure you'll get those kind of dynamics. I mean. What, what's going to be a big blow up kind of turn in, in this game? Is it going to be four person or four characters coming out? Is that four characters on the table actually doing a coordinated attack? Is it going to be two? Is it going to be 10? I mean, I don't think I don't foresee any scenario where you're going to have more than four or five characters on the table at any one time. The upkeep of that would just be enormous in, in terms of cost. If you decide to attachments. Build 
and turn one, you bought a three cost personality with four fate on them. Mm. And turn two, you bought uh, maybe you save a fate, and you maybe you go, okay, well, I'm going to buy. Uh, a guy, maybe, you know, two cheap guys, put three fate each on them. And then on t- the next turn, I buy a couple of guys with two fate. And then, Luke, you could have a monster turn. You could have a turn where you have six or seven or eight yeah. guys out, plus guys in hand. And that's a monster turn compared to a guy who's going to have three. But that's the thing. You, you're going to be you're going to be sacrificing all that information. So basically, when you spend your seven, you're telling the opponent, I have what's on the table. Uh, or anything that's zero cost in my deck, which is not a huge amount, I guess. There's not a huge amount of impactful stuff. In the, have we seen anything that would really, really turn the tides of a battle that costs zero from your conflict deck? Bonsai, yeah. Bonsai. There, are, there are a few cards. Yeah, yeah there's... Um, but but the, also, the I mean, there, there's, there are a number of ways of getting fate through your turn. So passing first is going to get you a fate. You, you certainly have rings that, when you announce it, could have two fate on it. So... You, it's very conceivable you could pick up three face later on in the game through a turn um, or more. But if uh, the thing is, if you're going for that big, the, the big glass cannon approach on your turn two, turn three, that you have multiple personalities, you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to, number one, have uh, or dedicate your resources early in that game. Or are you going to dedicate your resources early to defense or to, I mean, if you get a ring of, if a ring of void comes off for the opponent, you're going to be in a little bit of a, a tight spot because all of those resources you're putting into this one character are now in jeopardy. Yeah, but I'm, I think this is part of the the amazing depth of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that yeah, yeah. Every, every, every decision you make impacts the, the potential decisions your opponent makes, and every decision your opponent makes impacts what you do, and you have to constantly reassess what's going on. Um, and because the resource pool is, because again, we've said before, because the resource pool of potential actions is shared, you have to make an assessment if, you know, if, if I don't use this, how can my opponent use this against me? Yeah. And that adds an entirely new level of, of analysis to, to every single situation. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's just a, it's. I, I'm not sure I've ever come across a dynamic like this in a card game before, where decisions it's, that your opponents make are, you know, so impactful on how you uh, adopt and pursue. Because again, in the Crane game, there were a couple of turns where I was just saying, right, I, you know, I may need to completely abandon the idea of of honor running here and just <laughs> just see if I can, you know, if I can if I can throw out enough resources and, and go military. Um, yeah, 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 it's, yeah. But the thing is, you know, but you but you you actually have that option, or at least it seems at this stage you you have those options that you can, you I you know, I could have been pursuing honor and gotten up to twenty, and then just go no, this is totally working. Draw five cards, draw five cards, draw five cards, yeah. and attempt yeah. to swing the game back that way. So you know, it's yeah, I it's just I, it's very very hard to analyze formally because there's just a, there's a lot so of it is. Decisions. A lot of it's reactive on what's happening on the other side of the table as well. And um, when I was writing up that Crane article, uh, two of the suggestions I made were to make a one cost character and a two cost character turn one boat with two fate on it, which at the time I thought was a good idea. My other suggestion was go for someone big like Hotaru if you can get her out early and then just dump all your fate onto her. So Hotaru cost five, you put two fate on her. But uh, Eugene Earnshaw on the FFG forum pointed out that that was the wrong approach. And what kind of really was notable for me is if I do make a Taru, which I think is still a good option, um, first turn, and my opponent goes, all right, well, I'm going to make three or four guys potentially turn one, and I'm going to try to take two of your provinces, or I'm going to hold on to a little bit of fate in hand so I can use some of more, more conflict cards, and I'm going to really push for a turn one, turn two, turn three, the game will be over kind of approach. Um it's certainly very interesting, and the point, I, or w- one of the points that Eugene was making in that particular post was that the one-cost characters, you're probably just going to make them f- without any fate on them, because they're almost throwaway characters that aren't really worth investing in. Um, that made me kind of reevaluate, and I, you know, it's a, it's, it's only half a day later, and I kind of need to rethink everything from from the get-go again. But the the idea that your opponent will make something, and then you can see are they going like own suggested and going for a really big ramp up for turn four or are they going for a turn two or turn three like i've been talking about or you know maybe they're going straight 
tooth and nail for turn one. What do you do when they make a one cost personality and just leave it like that? Yeah, I mean, it's a. I, I think Eugene obviously he's a he. He's a former world champion. He's he he knows his stuff when it comes to L five R. But yeah. I, the only thing I would argue with his his logic there is that the the value is whatever you can get out of the card. So if you're investing two, it just means that you have to use that card in whatever way you can to get the value of two fate out of it. So if it's a one cost card and you invest two fate in it for the first turn, yeah, I mean that thing could recoup its value uh, within two turns if you capture a ring with it in, on the first turn, then capture a ring. Or do uh, let's say some other ring on the second turn, which has a fade on it, which wasn't used on turn one. So I I think there are possible uses for it, uh, and there are possible ways to recoup the value of anything that you invest your money into your your fade tokens into. Makes perfect sense, and obviously a, a one cost character that's right for the particular situation is worth far more than a three cost character that is useless when it comes out. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely. Right. But that's that's the beauty of the design as it stands right now. It's it's uh, like I I can only really applaud what they've done uh, with the diversity of just in terms of play dynamics, what what you can do in the games and what you can do uh, just in terms of like how you can get return on investment or how you want to get return on investment on the cards that you bring onto the table. Uh, it, it just seems like such a complex and such a such a great game already. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. You saw you talked about that sort of diversity because something you know, we spoke about, I think, in the very first episode was you know the idea of we've got a range of potentially sort of zero fate to five fate is, is pretty much seems what characters are going to cost. Maybe we'll see a mm. six fate at some point, but that seems. The uh, really the real upper limit, um, and the question we sort of asked at that point is: Is that enough design space to play in? Um, and to, has anyone sort of formed a uh, an opinion more advanced than than where we were at that time? Because I mean, it seems. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems like you're getting like Hataru at five. You're certainly getting value for that, and to to the point of you know when you add fate. Essentially, adding one fate to a taro is is a better investment than one fate on a two fate character. I I do wonder why the Matsu Berserker and the Doji Whisperer are different. One is a zero three, and one is a three zip. So the zip is obviously inferior because if that Matsu Berserker gets caught in a political conflict, out. Whereas the Doji Whisperer, if they get caught in a military conflict, they can stick it around and see if they can actually help out. But they're the exact same fake cost. Well, I would guess it probably has something to do with how they've designed both military and political to, to work. Uh, we've seen Absolutely. an abundance of yeah, you know, we've seen an abundance of boosts for military, um, which actually, if anything, makes the the crane card even better. better. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you can still you can still race across with your zero force guy, Banzai, lose one and take a take a province. Um, but again, it could purely be down to internal balance of factions. Um, uh, lot, lot, or it lots. could be down to you know clan weaknesses as well. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of things that can be, but uh, they're both cost one. And you know, how much of a difference is there between them? How far of a gap is there between a one cost to a two cost before it kind of pushes over? Well, I I'm not sure. I mean, another thing you need to take into account as well is the stronghold, because the Matsu Berserker with the stronghold is a four force character, and four yep. force will take pretty much any province that we've seen. Um, and that really does seriously add. I mean, that's a huge difference because the Crane province, I mean, the Crane stronghold is obviously just going to bow uh, a, a guy with two political power or less in a political contest. And that's, you know, the the, the, the capacity for the Berserker to actually advance your, your, your victory condition is overwhelmingly more powerful than that of the, 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 the courtier. But the courtier is much more flexible. So, you know, it's, it's you know, arguably, arguably fair. And maybe the, maybe the Berserker is actually just better. Maybe I'm. I'm glad I don't have to design these. <laughs> one thing. One thing I would say in general about the design of the the economy and the costs that we've seen so far. If you take into consideration the the length of the average game, so would you guys say that aver on average would a game go past four turns? Uh, on average, I'd say. Well, we had a three turn game the first time. The political game, the underrunning game, went to turn five. Was it? 
It was turn yeah, five because yeah, it was. I went first, then Baz kept on way of the unicorning me and staying first player. <laughs> so you're looking at you're looking at four between three and five turns, right? So any yeah, anything that you invest above, so if it's a one cost and you invest six in it, that will stick around for the entire game. Theoretically, it will stick around for the entire game. Or if you're looking at five cost and you want to get uh, you want to have it stay around for the entire game, it would be let's say ten uh, or 10 or more, 10 plus. So what I'm thinking is that there is sort of a soft limit to how much you can possibly put as a fate cost on a card because you can only put so much on it before the investment becomes more than you can possibly pay or recoup in terms of your investment over the course of an entire game. So if you have a character that costs 10, you have to get 10 fate worth of use out of it in one turn. It has to be worth 10 fate in one turn in order for you to, in order for it to be even balanced in any way within the mechanics of the game so yeah, i think I, you're gonna i think you're gonna see just maybe five maybe six and that's it because I, taking into consideration how short the game is i don't think cost can be any higher i mean as um evil gm what john points out in chat i mean a big part of the game is is working out when the last turn is going to be and not not having fate city on guys when the game ends because that's fate that could have been used as yeah, a yeah. deciding conflict card or one more <laughs> guy or, or something else but the flip side of that is if you guess wrong and I, I remember the very first game me and baz played i think we both <laughs> guessed wrong and again went to one more turn and suddenly all our guys left the board and it's like okay starting from scratch uh how, how can we get that last province so turn one again <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think I think that's going to be a huge part of that, and you know, be, being able to read the game well enough to know, okay, this has got one more turn in it, and you know, I've got enough of my cards to hold off, um, is going to be key. Yeah, but I mean, even case, in, yeah, no, go ahead. Case if he, if he's got it, he's got it. You know, you put all your eggs in one basket, yeah. you plan for no more turns, and if he's got it, he's got it. Yeah, but I mean, even in the game Baz and I were playing. Um, trying to guess when the game was going to end was actually was very, very tough. Uh, because one fate card can you know, one fate card could potentially stop a, a conflict, and that can be the difference between you winning that turn and you not winning that turn. Um, and if you and again if you make the mistake, if you if you don't plan ahead far enough or, you know, plan for that contingency, you can find yourself losing the game because of it. So sometimes you actually do need to overinvest um, purely as a contingency, purely as just a, a risk assessment. So and sometimes yeah. over investing is a protection from Ring of Void. There are a lot, there, it seems to be yeah. a chunk of ways yeah. to remove, which is scary. Or you being your bad. Yeah, those, those, those J Tetsubos were breaking my <laughs> heart <laughs> in that game. <laughs> that, that, really, that really expensive character that you really, that you've you know, <laughs> lots of fate on to, to, to protect it. But All if that fate's gone. If, if Hattoru had stuck around, she might have been winning some Void challenges just stripping Void from our fate from characters on the other oh, side. Yeah, yeah. No, she's she's a murder machine when she gets there. She's amazing. <laughs> oh, she yeah. is just she amazing. Looks, she looks like a powerhouse. I mean, she looks completely yeah lopsided, let's say, uh, when she goes on the board. Yeah, it does oh, seem yeah, like I one mean, of those cards that you either have the answer to her or... You, or you go, oh, oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Start, start bidding five on her for your draw face. And the the value of those unique personalities is, or those unique characters is something I'd underestimated originally because you manage to get her, you know, you you mulligan into a Hotaro, you bring Hotaro out, you try getting Hiroshima as soon as you can, and then you just blitz through your provinces until you start getting more of those uniques and extending the fate and getting more investment for free. Yeah, yeah. We definitely, yeah. I mean, we've talked about this as like the most Euro game card game we've ever seen, where it's, you know, bidding mechanics and, uh, you know, it's like worker placement, the way fate accumulates on unused resources, like the, 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 um, the rings. Yeah. But then for all that sort of elimination of randomness, it's still a card game with a deck of cards that's going to come out randomly. And if someone turns over... You know, a few Doji Hotaru in their their first couple of turns and just add a load of fate for free, that's gonna be really hard to deal with. But then you're just gonna pay two fate and put pacifism on her and what's she gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she's gonna crush you in political conflict. <laughs> well, because pacifism is just military. 
Or oh, is it just military, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, that, that changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, but, but the thing was, I mean, as much as the game, as much as when Ataru did hit the table and the game became Stop Ataru, um, there were plenty of tools to do that. And not through, you know, it wasn't it wasn't specific answers like the, the J Tetsubo. Yeah, well, okay, you're getting your fate back, but she's leaving the table this turn. Mm. Um, it definitely you know, seems so. like it's going to be a hard game to analyze to sort of, you know, a lot of games you can look back and say, okay, I made a mistake here and that's why this happened and so forth and that's why I lost. I feel like with this, there's so many moving parts. Yeah. You know, you uh, can say maybe this this could have done something different, but it's very hard to come to any sort of concrete answer. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think uh, most of the uh, old L five R was was definitely something that was difficult to analyze. But I think the economy of it was there were optimal plays, there were optimal strategies, there were things that you could do to get the most out of the deck that you had. Uh, and I used to like part of my professional. Uh, capacity is to is to model and simulate exactly these type of systems in games and if you were to ask me to do something in the new l5r uh, it would be one of the most complicated things i've ever tried to do i think the dynamics of this are just so complicated and so uh, like you said so many moving parts it's it's just it's a really really difficult nut to crack I think what's interesting is they've actually expanded out the battle phase in a lot of ways. They've taken a l look at modern game design, which is to increase the amount of back and forth in any game and gone, I take an action, you take an action. And you have to be able to respond to your opponent's plays. Mm. And you have to be careful about over committing. Like you could be like, oh, amazing, Hataru first turn. But in a lot of ways, you've ceded a lot to your opponent by doing that. You've committed to a particular course of action and you've narrowed down your play. And if your opponent has any kind of counter to that, you might be in trouble. Or they might be like, well, uh, that's, that's not good. So you're going to need in your deck to have uh, the ability to pivot a little bit and maybe control one super powerful guy coming at you or whatever. But you narrow your choice when you spend all your fate. Because I was thinking about it. turn one, there's going to be 15 fate in play on both sides of the table. But between the two sides of the table will be 15 fish. And other turns, there will be more. Mm -hmm. How much more will depend on the game, but there will be some more. And that means the first turn is a little bit more, like you're kind of immediately into the game, but there's a little bit of a ramp. There's a little bit more fate sloshing around in the later turns. And I think that's going to be critical at some points do do you think it's actually going to pan out like that though i i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure that there's going to be this massive pool of, because it'll get to a certain point right when you have 30 or 40 faith that you have so much faith that it doesn't actually matter costs kind of go out the window um if that and that's a scenario which i do not think will happen uh, i think no. it's going to be very much you're going to be spending your seven the most efficient way you can every single turn and stockpiling maybe one to two every turn if you can yeah, that's how I generally see it, you know, working out. I'm not so sure anymore. I can't. yeah. Well, this it's... is this is the beauty of the game. <laughs> this is the place to talk about it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, having having three or four fate when you're going into a conflict really opens up some big options for your hand. Uh, and your opponent isn't going to be able to do much about it because obviously it depends what you have in hand. And if you don't get to use it that turn you can always just make a character next turn with that same fate you just got to survive that one turn mm. but is it a... go ahead barry especially especially if you have characters in hand so if you've got characters from your conflict deck like you've got that seeker of wisdom for the the phoenix you know you can drop a i think it's a zero two anytime you want so will you stock that two fate and just wait for the right time instead then does, then does it become a, a sort of a, a a war of subterfuge and misdirection? Like your opponent is stockpiling fate. Do I need to stockpile fate? Oh do God, we, I hope so. Do we need, <laughs> do we need to you know have a cold war of stockpiling fate? Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, but it's one of those things that's going to change. Like as the card pool expands and as presumably we get more high cost characters, like do you, do you, do you do you like on your first turn do you just go no, I'm not buying anything. You know, I'm just going to stockpile seven, <laughs> next turn 14. <laughs> Boom, here we go. Now I'm going to dominate the field. Hotaru with seven tokens. Yeah, bang. 
<laughs> our fir- first conflict just drop your entire hand of characters and it's like that's it we're done you yeah. know what that's that's the deck i want to play that's the deck that's where i want to be at guys it's just just yaratomo and a, and a hand of 20 characters yeah oh, oh no, just 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 yaratomo <laughs> <laughs> if yaratomo is a uh, conflict card that that could be something <laughs> oh jesus yeah yeah that, that'd be interesting <laughs> surprise yaratomo <laughs> Um, so there's a couple things then in the Facebook that I thought were kind of interesting that, that sort of, uh, were revealed. So one, um, was that when decks run out, you lose five honor, mm. which, uh, it's funny. It's one of the, of all the questions that I, I hadn't actually thought about what, what that means. Um, and it definitely, you definitely feel like decks that are drawing five, you don't have to do that very often before you're getting pretty thin on conflict cards. Um. And I mean, thematically, it makes a lot of sense that that you know you've you've used all your your tools that are at your disposal, and you're sort of having to sort of find more resources from somewhere. And that seems to be a recurring theme in the game of the connection between conflict cards and honor and honor honorableness ness. Uh, <laughs> those are some there's gonna be some pretty epic military on military where it's like every every turn is like i'm drawing five how about you five <laughs> yeah let's do this and then like the entire deck is all free like force pumps and weapons and god knows what then his next turn it's like five five yay yeah. but if you get to the bottom of it and then you're just losing five honor and both of you have been doing it all along you're like well we can go another entire deck through and then yeah. one more time it's gonna be awesome <laughs> i think there should be some sort of like unspoken rule that if you both bid five you have to like high five and uh <laughs> <laughs> Eiffel Tower. But it, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a really good thing for a start. I think uh, being able to, to re- recycle your deck and uh, lose five for the privilege is, uh, is a really good thing. I mean, it means you, you won't have any stalled out games. Games will have to come to some con- kind of conclusion where both players have to play for the win. So it's, it's really, really good. Uh, apart from the fact that maybe that will take more than the allotted time for a tournament match. Which is another in the age of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our star, our sun might be burnt out by that time, but uh, yeah, let let's see. It's nice that it exists anyway. In the infinite game, there there is something going on there. There there are still there are still play dynamics to be sorted out. Yeah. It's not just a case of rolling a dice. Yeah. yeah. Well, the game looks like it's going to be tightly contested enough anyway. That that five yeah. honor is going to be a big deal because I mean Baz was down below five for most of the game. When he was playing military versus versus the crane, so I mean those games at all, yeah. But it's not, it's not something I'd expect to see come into play all that much. But mm. you just you never know. I mean, I think uh, the threat of it is almost sort of more important than how often it's going to happen. Yeah. So the fact yeah. that you go, okay, I'm down to five cards, for example, in my in my conflict deck means I'm going to start bidding one for then you know or two because of how many turns there are left. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again it's another yeah. case of, of you know reading the game and and i wonder how if the the crane card that makes you draw four if that can deck someone as well that's a kind of an interesting little dishonor sort of mechanism oh no although... it, it shuffles they shuffle back in Do they? you get down to that to that last turn and you're like i got five <laughs> and you go for the high five and your guy's going I got one. One more <laughs> honor and your five from reshuffling. <laughs> yeah, lose nine. I was a scorpion the whole time. <laughs> and uh, and then we, we haven't we've only seen a little bit of the dueling as well. Um I, I was really interested to see the what was that ability called? Um Judas training? Yes, the duelist training. The the opt out was discarding cards instead of losing oh, yeah, honor. Yeah. Um and I, I guess in testing they Maybe or well, maybe it was obvious from the get go. But once you get someone into that low honor lock, you're just churning out those duels, and you're just slice, slice, slice because they have to bid low, or they'll just instantly lose by dishonor, mm-hmm. which is interesting. But also, um, I thought the interesting point you made is uh, in in a honor duel that you may want to lose the duel just because you want to take the honor from someone that that. Bidding one and getting that honor may be a better result than. But you know what's you know what's better than um, losing the duel and getting the honor, winning the duel and getting the honor. <laughs> that's true. That's how that's how the crane and dragon rule. 
<laughs> so wouldn't know about I've that. got a I've, I've got a sort of a, a slightly related question. Um, we've seen mostly high honor clans, traditionally high honor clans, right? We've seen a few few phoenix things. We've seen the crane have been spoiled, lion, uh, dragon have always been a reasonably high honor clan. Have we seen many cards from scorpion or from any of the low honor clans? We've seen some, but I feel not a lot that's gonna that lets us sort of get a read because mm. the two strongholds they revealed were the lion and the crane. So we don't yeah, have yeah. a good idea of what a starting honor level is for the other clans yet. I think that's quite a key thing. We know yeah. Scorpion can play around with honor dials a bit. That's kind of uh, something we've seen with uh, I think Spayushi Manipulator. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thematic thing. I'm going to be very interested to see because I think the high honor clans have a lot more room to play when it comes to how they're going to manipulate honor, how they're going to work with like drawing, discarding, all of these kinds of things to do with the the conflict deck. Um, I'm really, really wondering how they're going to compensate for the lack of that with low honor clans. So the lack of flexibility that you have or how they're going to be able to, to deal with these kinds of things because... I mean, I was traditionally a, a low honor clan player. I think most of us were. Uh, Justin was. Uh, Owen was. I'm really interested to see how the the crab and let's say uh, the scorpion are going to look in terms of what they can do in battles and what how it's going to be different from what the lion and crane are going to do. Yeah. So yeah, we've we've seen relatively little from them. Um, we've seen a few bits and pieces from the crab. So we've seen. Uh, the Borderlands Defender, who's a three three for three, that can't be bad or knocked over the eager scout actually is a really interesting one like any mm. free character that you can just churn out um at no investment and then just throw out a province and see what's there is gets the job Fantastic. done sounds really good yeah the, the, yeah, shrewd, yeah. the shrewd yusuke uh, is giving them card draw which i think is really interesting especially if we're talking about them being able to draw a lot of cards as a, as a in theory military deck already um uh, and again, for for the others, I mean, for the 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 scorpion and the unicorn. Again, we're only seeing a few. The scorpion, I think, is the the trickiest to work out. Obviously, unicorn, you know, has lots of kind of mobility, unbowing tricks, moving in mm -hmm. stuff like this. But I haven't. I honestly have no idea what the scorpion are doing yet. Um, we've obviously seen blackmail, which is fantastic. Mm. Oh my um, god, that card is so good. Yeah, but really costly at three. Yeah, um, you got to have a lot of fade out, right? Yeah, yeah, we've seen the yeah. Bayushi Mi Manipulator, who I think is the one that meddles with the the Honor dials. Dial. Yeah, which I, I don't quite understand yeah. how it works, but okay. And then the young rumor monger redirects honor and dishonor effects, which That's could be pretty cool. It's, it's pretty fun, fun against Crane, I'd say. Um, I'm I imagine as a defensive option, it lets you dishonor your zero glory guys, which is great. But without seeing the rest of the card pool, we don't really know how it works in. Um, I, I mean, there was, there, was definitely, others, um, mystery. there was definitely something that happened at certain phases of the old game with Scorpion, where they'd get some really cool thematic cards and had, would have these great little tricks and then things you could do, but they didn't always help you like just go win the game. Um, mm. the, 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 you know, it was like, ah, I do this, and then, oh, I do this, and they go, like, okay, yeah, okay, that's, you know, have to deal with that. But ultimately, you know, if it's not helping you go take a province, honor run, dishonor someone, you know, that that the, you have to work out where the value is there. Um, so, in terms of concerns for me you know, about where the scorpion's going, that's sort of at the back of my mind is, you know, you know, they still need to be able to go win a game. <laughs> that's that's something I'm, I'm concerned about as well because in a game where you have such rich dynamics come from coming from battles and everything we've seen so far has been very battle centric are you going to have a control archetype are you going to be able to run a successful or design into the game a successful hard lock control archetype or are you just going to have something that falls flat in its face in between military and control because I think that's it's dangerous that the scorpion could fall into that. That that seems like the natural slot for them to fall into, honestly. I'm, I'm reminded of one of my old favorite decks, which was it wasn't even the deck I played. One of our friends put together a ninja dueling deck, which is pretty classical, <laughs> wonderful to play. It was only missing a victory condition. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, though, that all the guys we've seen, I've seen no support personality that has no stats that they all have some 
some po politics yeah. or some military. Mm -hmm. So if you get good board control or if you're playing like honor and dishonor and you're both pulling and tugging at each other, you can just go, you know, we can just resolve this by squashing provinces. It's not like the old days of uh, you dishonor where you're like, well, I have eight force total in this deck. I guess I could scrape together enough to take a province. Yeah. Uh, you're actually going to be able to go, well, actually, no, we can start knocking each other around if we're just, our tug of war is not getting anywhere. If we're equally strong, we can go the other direction and see if we can win out that way. And that's going to be an interesting deck design, the metagame concern when you're building your decks for your tournaments. Do you have a third, a second or third option in the deck if, okay, if the first one isn't paying out? Yeah, and the difference between a military conflict winning you to honor and crushing a province is a single bonsai. Yeah. I mean, I think what we will call control decks in the new game will be will be different to what you would call a control deck in, in a lot of other game decks, where it's not going to be a lot of hard removal, colored assassin type cards. Mm. It's going to be maybe taking fade off guys, maybe just, you know, bowing, bowing guys. I think there's going to be very limited numbers of cards that just take a guy off the table. And I think that Tetsubo was a fantastic example. Yeah. Um, even though it took a it took a personality off the or took character off the table, all of those resources that were invested or future invested were still there. They were returned back to the to the player. So, yeah. And uh, one other thing, I just wanted to sort of uh, take your guys' temperature. So when we saw this sort of sincerity keyword come out uh, on some of the crane cards, it'll be interesting to see if that keyword appears on other cards or if that is kind of a, a crane theme we we saw then obviously pride is another keyword coming out for the first line card uh that they spoiled at the end of the facebook event and that obviously seems very applicable to lion so there was some suggestion that these were sort of based on themes of bushido obviously sincerity fits that uh that idea but pride is kind of going going off piste and, it a bit, yeah, yeah, it is. yeah. It's but we, you can sort of see, yeah, you know, there's going to be clan themes. Uh, it seemed very flavorful. I thought I really liked the line one. There's sort of a risk reward there of that, you know, getting getting honored from winning battles and dishonored from losing battles. It seems very applicable to line. Um, sincerity just seems outright good. You know, there's no downside to just getting cards, but for free, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, what you're going to see is, yeah, sorry, go uh, finish your point. No, 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 th go no go. I'm done. Uh, I think that's what you're going to see in the, the law on our clans, honestly. I think you're going to see keywords that are going to be how they draw cards. And the, the, the conditions under which you draw cards will be not very, not as restrictive, I would say. Um, so I guess sincerity, when, you, when a character leaves play, draw one card. That's that's kind of nice, but you're losing something to gain something in its place. I think what the low honor clans will need is a little bit more return on the investment that you make. That that would be the thing that I would think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the other side of that is that pretty in high honor clans, cycling through guys is is often better uh, for their win condition because you know, if you if you can get a guy and honor them mm. quickly and cycle them out. That's that's you know quite a good result a lot of the time. Yep. Okay, so uh, I don't know. Do you want to talk about some of our uh, concerns for the game, and then after that we can talk uh, Gen Con for the rest of the night. <laughs> 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 um, I think we addressed my main concern, which was the presence of control, um, and I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how they bring control elements into a game where there is, by and large, one main mechanic that helps you win games, uh, and that's that's battles. That's that's battles at provinces and using the rings, manipulating the rings to to get out favorable outcomes for yourself. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess I think you go on, Buzz. Yeah, I, I think my big concern is uh, is rotation. Um, I this weekend I made it to uh, a netrunner tournament and there were six of us, um, which is actually quite good for for locally recently from what I can tell. And essentially the card pool has got ridiculously big. Um, we went out to get some food with 
with uh, some of the players later and it was all pretty much an agreement that we really have no idea what's happening anymore there's there's so much out there um the Sorry, no guys, we're not get, seconds. we're sure. not getting new players in um because the investment required to to get going again is pretty ridiculous and the rotation is a it should have begun already in netrunner but because of the way the dates lined up, uh, we actually have to wait for the current cycle to fully end before it kicks in. So it's even a little bit longer than we were expecting. So what are, just just to sort of give everything, what is a, a, a rotation and a cycle in Netrunner? Oh, of course. Okay, so I actually don't have the figures on hand, so I'll probably have to look it up. But the, the idea is that not every card that's been printed um, is going to be legal. Uh, so in Netrunner... The way they set it up is that the core set is evergreen, will always be uh, legal, that the big box sets, so uh, FFG have said that there's going to be bi uh, clan big box sets, so we'll see a crab and a scorpion, or maybe crab versus scorpion box sets come out uh, soon enough after the, the core game comes out. They'll, they're always going to be legal, so it's the packs in between, those monthly packs that you pick up. I think they're calling them dynasty packs. Yeah. Uh, those those occur in kind of groups of five to six. And uh, the idea is that each group of five to six is a, a kind of a block or a section. And after so long, the previous, the, the first set will rotate out and will no longer be legal. And then, you know, cards continue coming out every month. So the idea is you have a card pool of around, I think it's 2000 or something like that. And cards are kind of going out of it every few months and coming into it every few months. But the the size of it has been too large. Um, Netrunner was the first game that they tried doing it with, um, and it hasn't even kicked in yet. Uh, game of Thrones is coming along after that, and maybe if we're lucky, uh, L5R will have a shorter rotation. Now mm -hmm. it's kind of a it's a it's a tricky one for FFG because what personally I'm looking for them to do is take a big pile of my Netrunner cards and say that I can't play those in tournaments anymore. Yeah. But for for actual play and for the health of the game, maybe it's a good idea. Yeah. So just to be clear, there's a little bit of chatter in the, the stream. So Netrunner launched a Gen Con in 2012. Uh, are you saying that from 2012 to now, there hasn't been a rotation of cards out of the environment? There has not been a rotation, yeah. Jesus. Everything that was printed from... 2012 is still legal. That's that's pure insanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I, think, I think what they were thinking was, hey, magic rotates at about 2000. So if we rotate at about 2000, we should be okay. <laughs> but the problem is, Netrunner doesn't have the option of printing 50 two twos for three for draft. Like you can't print cards like that that are going to that are never going to be played in a constructed format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just they're just chuffa. They're just filler. You can't do that, and you need to have a look at what is the critical mass of cards. If every card has been designed with the intent to be relevant, at which point you you turn the dial. And what do you turn the dial on? Do you deliberately make the core boxes slightly underpowered, or you just say, guys, we're going to rotate? And we reserve the right to cut some cards from the core boxes out of the environment. But um, surely, surely that's the sort of arrangement or contract or the idea that you buy into with any of these uh, collectible. Okay, collectible card games, yeah, sure. But living card game is just an extension of the genre, really. Um, why would it be so evil, let's say, to cut cards out of the environment when you're when you're planning? If you plan to do so, and you inform the the players that it's going to happen. I mean. The other aspect of that is like who, who are you sort of screwing over by rotation? Okay, you've got um, your hardcore players who are pretty much buying just about everything that's coming out. So their 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 investment hasn't changed, right? So they're still buying your monthly packs and your deluxe things. Yeah, uh, and you know it just gives an opportunity for a new person to have a less intimidating environment if they want to get into the game. You know, a couple of years into into the rotation, into the cycle. The only, you know, conceivable person is a lapsed player who has some old stuff, but then has sort of bought nothing in between. Um, 
but I mean, that's that's you're getting into fringe cases there. It feels now. Obviously, the flip side is if FFG said, "Well, okay, we're going to make the last two cycles legal and everything prior to that, you know, you can't play." I'd be like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa what?" <laughs> um, so that's that's an extreme case. So I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a number somewhere in between. And I had a quick look up. I think they're settling on about fifteen or fifteen hundred as being the the max in the pool they're hoping for. And then once it cuts down, it goes down to about thirteen hundred and slowly builds up. And I think that's what they've decided is is their example or their their goal sweet spot. But from my experience in Netrunner, it is not working. That carpool is still too big and too messy. And because there's such a an amount of cards out there and so many interactions that can go on, I think it's made it a lot harder on the designers to actually balance things because yeah. with card pools that size, it quite easily gets out of hand. Yeah. And every and what if, yeah. sorry, oh, just, oh, no, go ahead, Andy. No, 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 you go. I was just going to say every new card you put in, it's like you're building this complex web of things that are connected to each other and every card you introduce to that web can make something horrible happen or can break the entire thing completely. Uh, it, it's just it becomes a nightmare. Yeah, one of the unintended consequences of a larger card pool is that it actually diminishes the number of viable decks because something broken will sneak through, and at that point, you're in a position where you have to start issuing errata or artificial restrictions or you know, well, you know, most wanted lists or whatever in, in order to try and artificially control an environment that is out of control. Um, and I mean, and that's. That's fine, but at the same time, if if that is if that's the way that the game is going to have to remain for the rest of time, then it's it's I mean it's not the most elegant solution, and it also means that it's a solution that is still going to have an oh you you'll you'll still have an overhang, you know the unless you remove the, the the problematic card completely, that card is always going to be there in some form or another. Mm. Um, and is going to dominate, you know, is, is going to shape the environment and in generally a negative fashion. Uh, or some specific interaction is going to dominate the environment in, in a negative fashion or shape the environment in a negative fashion. And we, we did um, see that with the Alpha War card pool. I mean, you can kind of see the yeah. sets where the power level yeah. spiked, yeah. and then the next set, they dragged it way down, and everyone complained that the power level was too low. And then a few sets later, the power level is way up, and everyone's complaining that it's. it's sets tricky. between it's tricky. I mean. Set uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And aspect that as I mean, players yeah. will we'll find something to complain about no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, I think, yeah. I mean, to settle on an aggressive uh, rotation program, or the other solution is you let the game stumble on for four, five, six years, and then you're at a point where, like, we're, we're just going to make everything illegal and relaunch, do Netrunner 3.0 or Netrunner 4.0 or game or L5 or third edition or whatever to try and fix the structural issues we have. So you actually need to engage with the problem and go, look, what is our metric? Is it a card pool size? Is mm -hmm. it an economic buy-in rate? Because let like we get at the start, we're actually happy. We're paying fifteen dollars a month or fifteen euro a month and or every six weeks or whatever. And, and it's grand. It's fine. It's a completely acceptable purchase for most people uh, who can it's it's not a big onerous financial burden. But it means that two years, three years, four years down the line, you're talking an insane buy-in for people to get into the game. Because I can't, I'm never, like, I used to be a whale in L5R. If someone came into the game and were like, I need this uncommon from three sets ago, I'm like, I got you. That's cool. Uncommons are not a problem. You know, commons are not a problem. I could give you those cards. You could build some kind of deck. But if you come in three years into an LCG, like you're you're looking at spending a massive initial outload of uh, live cash, and then it's manageable. But to get people to make that, to get people to make a jump to spend a hundred euros to get into a game is tricky but doable. To get someone to spend three, four, five hundred, you now you shrink massively the amount of people who will come in with that sort of buy-in. So maybe yeah. the rotation needs to be done on an economic basis rather than necessarily a card balancing basis because otherwise we've got a huge initial rush of people and then a steady decline and the only thing left at that point is to reboot the game again and all our cards go away so plus, yeah, but, plus you've burnt, you burnt a lot of people consumer along confidence. the way exactly you've, yeah. you've burnt your consumers along the way someone did cynically suggest and i don't think they were serious and it's definitely not true 
that uh, FFG's current business model is to release a brand new core set of something every year at Gen Con. And then that's a big sell. And then the next year, there's some new game that's a big sell, um, which it, it can yeah, feel that way. But yeah, if, I did. If, that, if that's their strategy, they need to look at Games Workshop, who had who ran something almost identical to that strategy. I mean, they actually, the churn was what they called it. You know, they had, you know, they basically say, you know, their their ideal customer was about 14, 15 years old, would play the game for one and a half years, and then would move on, and they would get a new customer to replace it. And yeah. that worked fantastically well in terms of building their corporation for, you know, the better part of kind of a decade and a half, two decades, and then their customer base collapsed. And they had to undergo a complete corporate, well, a complete rethink. Um, and, you know, they had to completely reimagine their strategy for how they acquired customers and retained customers and when you take a look at what they're doing now they're undoing for the most part all the they're, they're undoing all the steps that they that they previously took um in an attempt to win back customer customer confidence yeah yep. um but i think it's pretty clear think, that that's not the approach <clears throat> that ffg was ever going for and that's mostly no. based on the attitude they seem to have towards the game stores where they're very they seem very interested in getting people into those game stores and playing their games in there uh, rather than just buying box sets so yeah absolutely but i mean but like as you know I've, we've gone over now like there there are both there are, you know, there are card design reasons and economic reasons yeah. that, you know, that a, that a well-structured rotation is actually important um, for for the just for the long-term health of the game. Now, obviously, we don't know what their what their internal um, business strategies are when it comes to the games that they put out and how they, what, you know, how they envision their games or what what they want to get out of each of each individual property or game that they release. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with so all we can do is just go on what we'd do you know yeah, in, yeah. in an ideal world where you know there weren't any pressures of cash flow or anything like that etc etc now that's, um, that's the tail end of things that we're worried about the other side of things is the slow build in and we've we've ffg have confirmed to us that they are going to be doing uh clan box sets so let's say they do a scorpion box set is the first one out it wasn't a problem with Netrunner, but all of a sudden, Scorpion are going to be winning a bunch of storyline prizes, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, not necessarily. I uh, sorry, just to put in, but in most certainly, I remember in the, in the early days of the Netrunner releases, the clan that got released was usually just got a huge boost in power, like their decks just got better. But as those uh, as those luxury boxes went on, they tended to introduce alternative win conditions and completely different strategies. Yeah, that's true. That's so. Very true. That might be some. That might be a direction was, that they go. It, I mean, yeah, it tended to be but a balancing I act. Take your points. Yeah, and uh, often, yeah. often there was when they were designing those box sets, Clan A was poor, and they were like, "Oh, we'll give them a few more power cards." But by the time those cards got out, <laughs> that clan was wild. Or that faction was wildly out of control. And sometimes the reverse. There were some powerful factions early in the game that, when I guess they were designing their box, didn't need any help. And then by the time the box set came around, everyone was like, "Oh." I guess these are more cards. Yeah. 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 Um, so, and, and what is a typical split of a of a um, deluxe expansion in Netrunner or Game of Thrones in terms of if that was a Scorpion expansion? Is that you know fifty percent of that Scorpion cards and fifty percent everyone else? Is it thirty percent? Oh, it's a vast majority. There might oh, be really? like a card or two, card or two for each other faction. Oh, right. And yeah. then, I mean, that is. Vast I mean, majority would be adjusting that number is obviously a way that you can you can balance that. Yeah. How big that swing is going to be, right? Yeah, absolutely, and just you know, and the impact of the cards. I mean, you know, if if the Scorpion Clan box comes out and Scorpion are pretty strong, so Scorpion get a bunch of you know additional stuff that open up new avenues and Lion are doing terribly and Lion get an absolutely monstrous card that, uh, or a couple of cards that really boosts them, then yeah. yeah, absolutely. But again, that all comes down to their internal design processes and, and a whole bunch of stuff that we just don't have access to or, or yeah, can, yeah. You know, can, can, only, can only speculate on. But I, I think it is a big challenge for them doing their rollout phase. I think, and hopefully they will, they've had their two years to get through it, but they they for for a fan like me, I think they really need to be on on absolute top with their faction balance because it 
the storyline influence can can make or break things. And I, I would certainly feel hard done by if my faction was poor at the start and didn't win anything because of that. Um, and I don't think FFG are going to make this mistake, but we certainly have seen cases where uh, powerful cards came out because people won tournaments. And, you know, they, yeah. sometimes you get that cycling going. I think also... Are people, as, are know, people losing Dragon families, was, you know? Who, Dragon was terrible for 10 years and it didn't stop you playing, so... <laughs> But I think also it takes a bit of the luster off a storyline prize win if, say, Lion win uh, a Nationals or whatever, and there goes, oh, right, well, that's just because Lion are broken. And, you know, it takes away from the, the glory of it. Yeah, well, I mean, but this is another point of tension. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of, we've touched on before is, you know, clan loyalty versus just playing the best thing there is. Uh, because the game is going to attract an awful lot of new players. And for those players, clan loyalty, I mean... In fairness, clan loyalty is such an integral part of the psychology of the game that mm. I, I imagine an awful lot of players who do pick it up will go, actually, that's the clan I really like, I'm going to play that. And especially with the, the support of kind of clan sites and just other people who are clan players. But at the same time, you may have a significant, uh, you will have a significant portion of players, I'm sure, who will simply play whatever's the best at the time. Um, so that could further exacerbate problems, like the, the problem that Baz is talking about, where if Dragon are crap, then... You know, previously you might have had, you know, you might have had, uh, you know, a snowflakes chance uh, of winning a tournament because people would steadfastly play their clan uh, no matter how, you know, relatively bad or good those clans were. But if you've got, you know, half the field playing what's best, then no, they, if your clan is if your clan is bad, you're never going to win anything. The odds are just too stacked against you. Well, so, you know how but, I operate in terms of loyalty and, you know, playing playing the clan that's, that's higher, that I believe Highest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's some discussion raging at the chat at the moment uh, on a number of different topics. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Including just the discussion of the difficulty that we you can't just hand out decks. Like, you could used to be able to, if someone got interested in uh, the card game, you could go, right, well, have you bought your starter? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's bulk out your starter and make it something that's at least half decent. And I've got a bunch of rares that I'm not using, like, for the unicorn or the dragon. And we'll we'll get your deck going, and you'll be able to play with us, and you won't be, you know, 100% tournament ready. But you'll be pretty decent, and you can at least play and have fun. We're not going to be, like, we're not going to be able to do that. Like, I used to be a whale for Elf of War. I'd buy two or three boxes of every set, uh, or win them, or whatever, and then I'd fold it all up, and then I people would come along to tournaments and be like, I need this card, or whatever, and hand them out like that. Now, the suggestion there is print proxy decks, and, you know, again, is that where we're at? We can't go. We can't basically give out the whole experience, and considering how many props there are going to be in this game, yeah. Well, like in terms of tokens and dials, yeah, we're just going to basically build up a stock of them and go. Okay, this is our learn to play packs. Get yeah. going. I mean, this, this, this might just be one of the sacrifices that that old school players are going to have to make and just get used to. That that's just not a fa it's not a feature of the new game. Yeah. Um. I mean, we can we can certainly we can do our best for for new players, but. It's just as as a part of the as a part of the LCG model, you know that that is just not a feature of the the but, collectible aspects that they built into the game. Now, but again, one we thing are, we might be able sorry. to do, one thing we might be able to do is you know build an extra deck, possibly two, depending how it goes, because it's going to be one main clan, and then you're going to faction in one. If there's two of each neutral cards, like we think, you should have a playset out of that. Now, obviously, or you have two playsets out of that. You're not going to. If you're only getting one pack as you go, obviously that's going to become less and less. But as your card pool increases, you should be able to put two, maybe three decks together. So you could turn up to a local tournament, bring an extra deck, and then hand it over to a guy and go, look, here, try this out. Yeah, See what you absolutely. Think. I think also yeah. we're, we're looking at this from the perspective of tournament players. Like, is this? Do FFG expect every single person who's going to pick up this game to play it in a tournament setting? Absolutely no. not. No. So... I mean, is this game playable if you have a base set and just pick up the last expansion or just pick up the clan that you want to have and play against your buddies, have fun like it was uh, a board game or like it was any sort of just pick up and play kind of card game? Absolutely. The thing is, this is going to be a fun game regardless. And I think you're going to see 
a lot of the more casual players not investing in the entire back catalog of cards and sets that you have in the game, but just in what the most readily available ones are and having a really good play experience with it. So yeah. ju just on that, I don't think the the way the base set is set up is actually a good proper experience. Uh, you'll definitely be able to sit down because of the, the mechanics of the game rather than the cards. You'll be able to kind of get a good gist of it and it'll probably be a good game. But I don't think you're really going to actually get to play off for until you get three base sets and you're good to go. And I'm I'm very happy with that. And I know I said in one of the earlier ones that I want to be able to get a box for my sister and hand it over and let her play with it. And I'll probably still do that. But she's not going to get the proper experience but I'm happy because that means that FFG made a decision and decided we're going to print this for the serious players, the dedicated Alpha 4 players who want to go hard into this whole thing and have no restraint whatsoever. Uh, and I think that's good. But they've built a game that services or serves uh, all, I'd say, all yeah. levels of players. Yeah, no, um, you're right. We were talking the very first uh, podcast about uh, complication versus complexity. This is not a complicated game. It's a complex game. Therefore, the barrier to entry for a player, for a very new player, should be re reasonably low. And the cost of entry is also reasonably low. And that just means that we're going to have, I think, a lot of new players in L5R. And that's now, a think, really great thing. I think the real barrier is all the sets have sold out already. <laughs> all right. So on that note, I I'm sure we'll come back to this topic again and again. Um, but I think it might be worth uh, moving on and talking about the. Uh, some people are talking about magic as the elephant in the room. I think Gen Con might be the elephant in the Skype chat. <laughs> um, there's, it was sort of touched on it tangentially uh, a few times in terms of uh, how uh, FFG have been sort of annually pushing a, a new big LCG each year and launching one at, at Gen Con. Uh, so, Owen, you're going to Gen Con. I don't think anyone else is. Is that correct? Justin's uh, gone. No, I'm, uh, Justin's I'm Justin going is as well. going. Okay. So, uh, was, was, was that a, was that a change? Did you uh, sign on late? I, I was signed on. <laughs> so, um, he was volunteered. <laughs> yeah, I was volunteered for the for the job by some uh, <laughs> really really kind people. So, so uh, okay. So to take you back. Um, Gen Con is really a series of mini games. If, if you want to go to Gen Con, it's not as simple as just, you don't simply go to Gen Con. There's a, there's a lottery around accommodation. Uh, and now there's also what's becoming an increasing problem is the lottery around events. So yesterday at 5 p.m. Irish time, the events went on sale. Now what happened is everybody had created a wish list of events they wanted to play. And at 5 p.m., everyone got to click a button to submit their wish list. Everything was sorted into, as the signal came in, everything was sorted into a list. And basically, the first person on the list got to fill their events, second person, third person, so on. And very, 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 very rapidly, stuff started to fill up. Uh, I, okay, we all clicked at exact, I, I clicked the second that button went live, I hit that button. And I was placed eventually at position 6,000 in the queue. It took three minutes for me to actually get assigned that position, but then I was in position 6,000. So people are talking about it sold out in 15 minutes. It did not. It sold out in under a second because once you click that button, you were put into an algorithm or whatever, you got put in the list, and then you might, might or might not get your chance. Uh, so if you clicked... Um, whatever you should like you should be put in the list now i've got some people telling me that they click late and they got put up in front of the queue which is a disaster if that's true but uh i, I was told there was some sort of randomization element into it but yeah i, I have no idea i know with the housing they do a lottery and you just get your position in the lottery but this was eight thousand people slamming the server button at once which is always yeah. a recipe for technical success right yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, it is fantastic. And the thing was, FFG were quite generous in going here. Here's 350 spaces in this first tournament. But kind of, I don't think they were generous enough. Um, be, just because 
I think it's the hot ticket item at Gen Con, and a ton of people are there going, I, I just want to, you know, I want to play Alpha, I want to just get my Alpha War box set, and I don't particularly want to do the three hour FFGQ. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, uh, I, I find it I, I find it really hard to give, you know to put any blame on FFG in the situation because you know they can only do what Gen Con allows them to do in terms of um, you know how that well how their how how their events are assigned and how people buy tickets yeah. for their events. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like it's it's not like 350 people is a small number because I think the biggest L5R event ever at Gen Con was 410 or 20. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty close to the biggest L5R event that Gen Con's ever had. And now, I do it. FFG also have some big real estate games, like they're running X-Wing, they're running mm. Armada. They're, they've recently introduced Rune Wars, which I think is a three-by-three three table. Um, they need a lot of space for the games that they already have. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, but I'm not saying, but I, I think the way Gen Con, orga Gen Con organized it was, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I can't come up with, you know, a, a viable alternative to how you would do it. But the fact that it does, the fact that, I mean, I think it's just, the, it, it's the fact that, you know, L5R is a game that people love. I mean, you know, it's, it's the kind of game you play for a lifetime, as pretty much all of us here have. Um, and to get stung on something you're so invested in. in yeah. And, so, you know, it's something that you, you you desperately, desperately want to play because it's the game that you love. It's it's the game, you know, really that's that you've played throughout most of your life. Uh, and to be jipped out of that on a lottery is, uh, and not just, I mean, and plus plus a lottery that can be abused. Yeah, I mean, I, there's because if if you've got people going in and buying. You know, buying many, many tickets for for you know for for other people. I mean, I mean, there there are there are absolutely ways to play the system if you want to, and I think that's what that's what really stings. I think um, it's just yeah, it's 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 a it's a whimsical system, um, and yeah, it's it's not one that's set up to reward how much you love the game. It's one that's set up to reward scalpers more than than people who really really do love it. So. You know, that's just. I, uh, and I heard that there was a there was a wish list like uh, that you put things in priority, but it didn't seem to make any difference. That whoever got the top of the list got everything they wanted, and yeah, it, it didn't yeah, really I mean, matter that you put L five first when the guy yeah. at the top of the list had put a twentieth instead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'd, you'd think with a wish list priority, they would take like they would take blocks of you know whatever one thousand people, and just they would process that one thousand people through their wish list uh, or whatever. I you know I don't know, but it seems like the wish list thing was completely irrelevant. Yeah, um, and it's sort of sparks but... saying, do you think the fact that uh, the tournament and the product are like this package thing is part of the problem? That that people are yeah. signing up for the tournament because they just want the box and they might play yeah, a few absolutely. games and then leave halfway through oh no question yeah i yeah a lot of people are just going to show up and get the box a lot of people are going to show up get three or four boxes and then go straight and, out and put them on ebay and get your promo yeah and get your promo which is you know, how big you think the... ffg could do something with the promos they could go we're going to give out the promos in round five something yeah, like absolutely. that yeah absolutely yeah absolutely how many people do you think are going to be in this tournament how, how many do you think are going to play Ooh. Yeah. If, you, if you could put it yeah, on i would I'd be with Owen. I'd say 250. I'd say there'll be about 100 open spaces. Yeah. Probably. So is, 100, it, is it guess. possible to get a, a general Gen Con ticket and then turn up when there are spaces still left over? Yeah, there are. You, you, can, you can buy generic tickets and then show up. Okay. Um, but the problem, but the, is, pro the problem being... Queue for your product. If someone shows product. up and goes, here's, yeah, yeah. here's my box, and now I'm gone. Because part of that tournament, like the big part of that tournament is you get, you know, you get your starter as part of the your or your core set as part of the the entrance just lock the doors just so you know it's leaving <laughs> <laughs> more stuff you're, to make the fire marshal happy um yeah yeah you're paying, yeah, playing playing six rounds <laughs> you know, if, if anything i think this is going to contribute to an even more deadly rush for ffg's booth oh. uh, on thursday morning oh i'd say you know, there, there are there are going to be there are going to be people trampled underfoot. You know those sort of <laughs> Black Friday videos at Walmart. It's... Yeah. Oh, it's going to have 
going to have nothing on the FFG booth. <laughs> there are um, people... optimistic suggestions that uh, it's going to be in the FLGS's friendly local game stores um, quite soon, like within the week afterwards or something like that. But that's that's wild optimism. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think that is. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I think early October is when previous games at Gen Con have turned up in in in, in stores. stores. Yeah, certainly. So, I think uh, is it Jim Freeman from Patriot has said that the the release date that they received was the 29th of September, end of September, start of October. Okay, okay. so a full month, is, so more than a month after the. Yeah, I think that was the distributor date that they received. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's better than I thought. But, I was maybe early November, late October. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of I'm semi pulling that out of my ass. I'm pretty sure I saw it. Yeah, uh, almost, I'm trying, almost positive I saw it, but I could be wrong. So, and any date yeah. is just ink. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. much it is. I mean, you know, like anyone who's again, anyone who's played FFG games before, uh, sometimes that sometimes that boat takes an awfully long time. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, <laughs> and as we know, it's about deeds, not words. So, yeah. But the killer yeah, for yeah, this is FFG are looking at the situation going. Oh, because in some ways respects they're powerless here because they don't they can't go to Gen Con, hey, can we seat another hundred people for this tournament at this yeah. stage? No. All yeah. that space is allocated. Can they even get more product in? I mean, what's probably the only thing they can really do is maybe have some more product and God knows where they get that from because if it is kind of coming over for October, what they've probably done is air freighted a bunch of product mm. to have some. Yeah. So you've got to hope they have a couple of, you know, probably two or 3,000 boxes of L5 ore. I mean, they may not have have nowhere near that um, because it's expensive to ship and it's really expensive to get in the country early. And if they have that, awesome. But if they don't, their ability to fix this or help with this problem is extraordinarily limited. What they, yeah. can they do? They can have more boxes there. If they have more boxes there, you can at least go, okay, Buy your box first thing Thursday. Go to the 12 o'clock tournament. And when people take their product and leave, we can sit additional people in that tournament. Yeah. There may be some ability to expand the Friday tournament, which is the 100-player tournament, which you also require a box for. There may be some ability to expand that if there's space, but there's, pro there's no guarantee of space. They would have to probably cannibalize space from their other games to do it. Yeah. And those games are probably going to be full too. So they're going to have limited play there. I'm sure they're going to do everything they can, and like you know, I you know I'd certainly help if I could. But uh, I think it's just they would want to do stuff. But I think their ability to do stuff, even with this three month notice or nearly three months worth of notice, mm -hmm. is extremely limited. And that's got to be incredibly frustrating for them because I think they really wanted this to be a big deal. They invent like they put 350 spaces on. That's a very respectable amount of space. But yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And that, that's all stuff that they're going to be able to do on the day. Um, there's there's a PR person in FFG up all night tonight trying to work out what to put down tomorrow because as their first response to this whole debacle. Well, it's not a debacle. Situation. Yeah, it's not it's, it's a situation. not a debacle. It's but just I mean, it's a bunch of rabid players who really, really want this game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a testament to their marketing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've yeah. hyped the shit out of this game and they've got a really engaged player base who's chomping at the bit to get their hands in this thing and people just want to play. I mean, all they've got to do is try and facilitate that as best they can. And the logistics yeah. must be a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, the, the, in fairness, the tournaments aren't actually all that big a deal. You know, people people just people want to play. Um, whoa, whoa, I mean, whoa. The, what there is mean? storyline, Price. What do you mean they're, they're, no, no, they're not? No, no, people there's, want to play. As, no, 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 as, there's not there's just... There's not just a storyline prize. There are titles on the line. I I did read the titles thing. The titles. Thing. I didn't uh, see that. What was that? I'm, Can someone give me an is, overview? Which is, which is fine, but at the same time, you know, I, for me, certainly for me, I mean, the tournaments. The tournaments. I mean, obviously, it would be lovely to be playing in the, the in the you know, the Friday tournament, the Saturday tournament. I mean, it would be great to be playing in those. But really, I just want to play the game, and I will be, I, I will be actually, I will probably have. A much more enjoyable, fun time playing with friends across, yeah. you know, a floor, than than being in seven rounds of Swiss again. For, you you, know, you turn time. down that title when they try to give it to you, Walter. <laughs> all right, turn that down. Yeah, Master of Fire or yeah, something like that. You know, that's, that is a completely that is a completely different situation. 
<laughs> so can someone tell me what the titles were? Because I missed that. Uh, what... uh, we, we, we really have no idea, but in one of the, the messages that went out to people who yeah. did get options, I think, it said, uh, in addition to participation prizes, players will earn prizes and titles based on their record and finishing position. The top finishers will influence the very first story choice. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, yeah titles, titles was unexpected. It is kind of exciting, to be honest. Do you think but there'll be is... some sort of a uh, ranking system, like a uh, Neo Magic? They have Planeswalker points, or something like that now. That, that, that sounds like a lot of effort. No, I, I don't think. see it. Yeah, too much it. effort. It will yeah. just be something it's to practice. Necessary. Yeah. Um, and but... the promo cards is the other kind of aspect of that. That was kind of interesting. I want them. Plant, plant <laughs> based. Apparently, pick your yeah. plant, get your promo, which means. <laughs> You, you get into that, you walk away with one-seventh of the promos that you could be getting. Does that mean we're going to have a singles market? Secondary card market? Oh, yeah. Oh, have, you not, have you not played other FFG games? Oh, my <laughs> God. I, I, I haven't played them a lot, but I, how do you even value those kind of things? I mean, how do you value something which you can uh, get? Pr pretty ridiculously, actually. Shit. Like and if, some of if, the from 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 Netrunner, some of the very early um, kind of tournament... Uh, shop tournament promos they were going for ludicrous money by the you know we're going for like 50 70 dollars jesus and okay these were, okay these were these were these were single cards these were alt art cards that were sent out that every single you know friendly local game store could buy and host okay um and, and there were a couple cards, of those these, these yeah. are cards that all the players already have just with a prettier yeah. picture uh the <laughs> alternate art cards and, okay and enough. sometimes not even prettier yeah just <laughs> different <laughs> you know? Thing like the Adonis, like the Adonis. Oh God, that was. What? The he was promo was, he was ripped. The Adonis <laughs> promo was hideous, though. It was so much worse than just the, than the basic Adonis. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Neither here nor there. But no, but those card those cards were worth serious money. And even like yeah. even the stuff in even the the promos and X Wing and stuff like that. Those cards still go for fifteen twenty dollars each. And the, right. the, the mats and stuff like that, you can't even get them. Yeah, I mean, like Jesus, what was it? One of what was the what was the the Netrunner thing we played in? I've even forgotten the name of it now. There was a bag for the prize. Oh yeah, Terminal. Yeah, yeah. No, it was uh, Cronus Protocol. Cronus, Cronus Protocol. Those, I mean, those bags because that that was a Europe only prize as far as I know. Yeah. And the last time I saw one on eBay, it was going for almost two hundred dollars. Jesus! Wow. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. no, notably in this case uh, if there's 35 players 7 clans and an even split that's 50 of each card in circulation if these are gen con only that 350 tournament only that's ridiculous that's that's yeah, silly. It's, it's that's going to be some that's going to be some big hype um i really hope that it's not just exclusive to that i'd love to see them do some store yeah. tournaments where you yeah, can pick it up i really don't mind if I, if I, yeah if it's unplayable if I, were FFG, I'm fine I would with be it. If I were, yeah, if I were if I were FFG, I would be doing you know emergency prints of those cards and getting as many of them over to Gen Con as I possibly could. Yeah, yeah, just uh, give them out like they were falling from the sky, like raindrops or yeah, whatever. Absolutely. absolutely, you know, it's just yeah, uh, you don't want I you know exclusivity of that kind of level at this stage in the game. I'm not sure is a, is a, is a wanted thing. <laughs> it sets a bad precedent but, anyway, very early yeah. on. But, yeah. but it does it does show a precedent with FFG because they have gone for clan based stuff so yeah. day one you're in you've picked your clan you get your clan promo that player is already 100 percent going for that clan from from there on out and yeah. it does suggest they're going to be doing this a lot more that we'll probably see top of clan prizes and things like that which is something that a lot of people have been talking about and asking yeah. for and uh, i think yeah. it's yeah. exciting they're I serious think, well, about clan allegiance which yeah. is great it's, it's it's part of the core psychology of the game they'd be mad to ignore it yep yeah. And it is it is fun when or it'll be really fun when we get the interaction between the old players and the new players because I mean the guys that play uh, all the other FFG games are and actually the, the Netrunner group that I, I was talking about last weekend are very very hyped and very very interested in uh, playing Alpha War. And I'm sure some of them are going to be faction loyal but a lot of them are just going to come in and play to have fun and play to win. Uh, and in the, the the kind of older tournaments that we used to play, it always felt like you kind of knew who you were going to be playing against. You're like, well, there's this many unicorn players, there's this mm -hmm. this many crab, this, and you could kind of judge. And 
I, I had heard of, of stories of like crane players buying up all the unicorn starters to make sure that there were no <laughs> unicorn players in the environment because they just like cavalry. What one of the other podcasts mentioned that. So like the, the environments tend to be quite static and people knew what were in it. But with the mix of the two different types of players, uh, I think we'll we'll probably see more of a shift and a spread than we're used to. Or maybe they'll settle down and they'll they'll kind of get static where where we necessarily didn't. But uh, this actually leads to another thing, right? If you're bringing if you're breaking down uh, fifty cards, let let's say it's yeah, there's fifty promos, one for each clan. Or, yeah, so three three fifty. Three fifty divided by yeah. seven. Yeah, that's how many slots. There are not going to be fifty players of every single individual clan. And no. I've never seen a no. tournament where no. representation was that There'll uniform be some across the board. There'll be some spares going around. But this is the next thing. Who is going to be the most represented clan, do you think? But but now they've removed Mantis and Spider, you know, the crappy clans that no one liked anyway. I mean, it's going to spread things out nicely. Or they'll all go to the Scorpion <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the, the affinity... <laughs> Sensor, sensor. <laughs> well, I presume we're. I presume we'll see like the the, the like the dragon was always the the most was almost you know unbelievably uh, incomprehensibly inconceivably. <laughs> it, was it was very popular despite the card mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Just well, I suppose like it's 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 the the pure archetypal Eastern mysticism, you know, monks and kung fu and mysterious duelists kind of clan. So. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure Dragon will still be the most uh, will still be the most popular clan. My my best on Scorpion. Yeah, Scorpion. so so look at the the Discord have a, a system where you can like register for a clan, and a quick uh, look at that sort of split. Scorpion is in the lead by quite a bit. So it's forty Scorpion players, twenty eight Unicorn, thirty three Crane, twenty eight Crab, nineteen Lion, twenty nine Dragon. 16, man- get, 16 Mantis. 16 Mantis. Some... <laughs> uh, spider. If, if they get some Six Spider. Ninja cards down. I mean, anything could happen. Ninja will sell. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think, pe- yeah, people like being bad guys as well, right? Bad guys are cats. I mean, they always sell, right? Or pirates. <sighs> but they took the pirates out of the game. <laughs> mistake it was a mistake yeah. a big mistake we'll although see. pirates are pirates are very 2008 so and with, the, with they could have had the marketing tie-in with the new pirates of the caribbean god knows what's happening <laughs> oh, now jesus yeah, yeah don't talk about that johnny depp <laughs> is your otomo let's not let's, oh. Oh, oh. i think your otomo oh. is be an interesting uh, design direction for the map <laughs> <laughs> Owen, um, yeah, I, I think we should end the stream there. I just, I just can't, I can't deal with this. I can't even. I can't even. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we're we're an hour and a half in, and I feel like we could actually go for another hour and a half, but uh, we should probably save people uh, that pleasure for another couple of weeks. <laughs> I think there's a lot of topics as well that we're going to come back to uh, again and again. So uh, let's wrap things up. Uh, thanks to all the guys for joining us. I hope, uh, pe- and thanks for all the people in chat because I think there was some really good uh, points being raised and it really helped the conversation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Chat was awesome. Uh, so we'll be back in two weeks' time. We may, um, we'll probably do a, um, a Lion Crane game when we get some Lion cards on Tabletop Simulator. Looking forward um, to it. Yeah. And oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. All right. So, uh, Nidal, guys, thank you for joining us and see you soon.